Okay, this talk is about the sub solver and basically the algorithms behind it, um, which is actually not really the reason why the new code is so fast, but the real reason is the different repository uh, ending. But this is a, a rather boring topic. The inter more interesting topic is the solving part, so I'm talking about the solver here. So, first of all, what was the issue with the old solver? I mean, it just got replaced for 10.1, and now we're replacing it again. What, what on earth happened? For? So, basically, it turned out that it was just too slow. It was written, it was the old solver from the Red Carpet project. It was um, basically written so that the um, company can keep their workstations up to date. So it was written with a mindset that there is one update, small update repository that they call the channel red carpet, which is subscribed to, and then the solver just always installs the newest version of one package. So when we used it for complete installation, especially with the build service left where we have 10 or 20 repositories added, it just broke down. Um, so we really had cases where solving took several minutes, so that's why in the code we disabled some things like when the, the original Red Carpet Solver um, branched at every alternative and tried every solution and then had a, a metric and chose the best solution at the end. But this turned out that we couldn't do that with so many packages. And OpenSUSE has about 10,000 packages and it, it, we had 10 minutes or so. So part that code got disabled very fast, but then of course they don't have an optimal solution in such cases. And the other problem we had, it really could get stuck. It could, there, were, there were times when it couldn't find a solution and just hung it, <coughs> probably due to bugs. We never found out exactly what was going on there. So the Dust team actually implemented a timeout. That, uh, <laughs> that after a couple of minutes you'll get a request or something's wrong. <laughs> Do something different, I can't help you with that solving. <laughs> so that they get smoother feedback. Another issue we had, we did that extension, extension with the weak dependencies, so where we have recommended packages and suggested packages, and the idea behind the recommended packages is um, that they basically get installed when it's possible. But as the code was pretty fixed at the moment from, because we took it over from the carpet, it was really it didn't integrate well into it. So basically the server more or less treated treated recommended packages like required packages. So it it couldn't go back and deselect the recommended packages and then branch on something else because then it also the code would but yeah, are you okay talking about the zip now or the current product? Uh, that's basically for 10.1 and 10.2 it's the same. The lipsip <coughs> we took over the solver from red carpet. Mm -hmm. So the red carpet code was written in C, it was put to C plus plus and put into lipsip, but the algorithms are the same. Okay. Yeah, and another thing which really annoyed the users is the bare diagnostics. So if a a problem and the user action turned out to be unsolvable, then you got a requester telling you that libfuba requires uh, dependency bar and but none of the providers can, can be installed and you, you think, gosh, what's that? I never requested libfuba, why is it telling me something about libfuba about that other package installed? So, so the user just doesn't know what to do with that and the, and the, so the suggestion the solver did was um, don't install it FUBA or break it FUBA. The user doesn't know what, what the FU does and why it's there. So this is also not great. But the thing that the new solver will do very much better than the old solver. Speaking about the new solver, why on earth is it called SAT? That's because it's, a, uh, it's named after a standard um, a problem from the Algorithmic thoughts, it's called the Boolean satisfiability problem, which basically is that you have got a big Boolean expression with some variables in it and 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 or or not. And the job is 
the algorithm must find a solution for the problem, and solution is defined as find a assignment for the, all the variables so that the resulting expression is true. So this is actually uh, NP complete, so it's a hard problem um, when the when the clauses are the, when the expression here is, is not very trivial, it's, it's NP complete. So what you normally do with such projects problems and what you also do with the algorithms you do some sort of search with that tracking. Of course easy thing, easy preprocessing is normal, normalization. So we have the big expression and you normalize it so that uh, it all the expression now has this form, which is um, some some variables with or in it, and then and then of course you can have the negation here, and you and all the um, terms here are, are connected with an end. So this is normalization form. Here's an example. You have uh, A or B or C and not C and uh, not A or C is true, and the uh, solution would be. Or set A to false, set B to true, set C to false. Yes. Then this is true. This term is true because of the B. This is true because of the C, and the last term is true because of the A. So this is the solution. Normally, there are multiple solutions for a problem, but I'll come to that later. What to do there? What are the advantages here of this? Of the using the sub algorithm, the very big advantage. Is very well researched problems with lots of papers and lots of people, intelligent people have thought about how to do that really, really fast. There are very, very good algorithms out, in, out there that to solve such problems. An example would be Schaff. Schaff was a very good solver which, which introduced some special things to make it fast. And Minisub is pretty much state of the art. And Actually, my code is, is based algorithm-wise on the Minisat solver. So it's really, really fast because it's researched that well. Actually, the good thing is, for the sat forks, package solving is basically trivial. There's yearly um, competitions where the solving algorithm compete against each other, where they have millions of rules and, and hundreds thousands of variables. and so. Our little dependency problem is for them so so small a problem. So the sub use we, we have normally uses um, solves the problem in milliseconds. So it, they, they don't even bother about thinking about that. Their their problems are solved in minutes or so or hours. So it's really not that not hard to solve dependencies. The code uh, the algorithm is pretty easy to understand. If you know about the come from the sub, from, uh, if you read some papers or so, the algorithms are very basic, and, and I show you later on some of the main things how solving is done. So it's not hard to understand. And if I look, it's just a, a couple of hundred lines of code, whereas the old red carpet solver used to let's it was a couple of hundred code, so it's about ten times less code to understand. And that's that's good because if it's the community is working on it. With ten thousands of lines of code, it's, it's hard to find people to, to, really, to really dig into that code and understand what's going on. It's just hundreds lines of code, people will contribute to it. And of course, as I said, the algorithm gives you a nice little, if there's unsolvable, it gives you really good um, suggestions how the problem can be turned into a solvable problem. So, this is also much better than with red carpet. So let me start on the digging more into the depth into it how how the normal package dependencies are turned into a sub problem. Um, say we have a package A and A has a one dependency that it requires um, dependency B. And B gets provided by packages B1, B2, and B3. So the idea is now that this can be transferred into the following rule. As you can remember, the rule, all the rules must be true, and uh, all the terms and rules are uh, connected with OR. So the rule is, it's either A is not installed, or one of the three packages here is installed. This is exactly what the requires also says. If it's installed, then we need one of those, otherwise I'm okay with it. 
same with conflicts. Um, if I have a conflict dependency, A, no, not price, but conflicts with B, and B again is provided by B2, obviously, what my transfer uh, is then, I get three words from that, namely um, minus A or not A or not B, B1, so this is true if either A is not installed or B1 is not installed, but just only false if both are installed. And that's exactly what the conflict says. You must install A and B1. And the second one is the same. You must install A and B2, and you must install A and B3. Um, obsolete's pretty much work the same way. Normally, the, if for installed packages, they are ignored, but for uninstalled packages, obsolete's are treated as conflicts. Because the server doesn't know what to do if you select a package A for installation, and A was not installed before, and select B before uh, installation, and B is not installed before. And if A and B obsolete, now no, what is the result? If it, it first installs A and then B, um, then both packages will be installed, but if it first installs B and then A, then the other one is obsolete, so it's, it's undefined, so it should treat that conflict because actually they can't exist very well in the system together. If the other package is already installed, then of course obsolete is, is ignored and then it also works. That's actually that's for obsoletes that are really direct directly in the package, but of course there are also indirect obsoletes, namely packages with the same name. If you have if you have one package A which has a version one with another package uh, A which has a version two, you can't install both because they obsolete each other more or less. So if, if I would install it with minus minus U with RPM, then the other package would be done. So it's also packages with the same name also get those uh, conflict rules here. This is of course where you can do special casing because in SUSE normally if you have a kernel then in, in, when the patch comes in and secure adapter for kernel it doesn't uh, automatically deinstall the old kernel so wherever you would special case you would just drop the rules for those special cases but normally you will have you want to also need um, packages with the same name. You want to conflict sorry you want to conflict those. So there are also unary rules. These are basically special cases. When, when there's no nothing that provides a requirement, then of course the, we will have a unary rule that not that is here not A, which just says to the subsolver, package A can't be installed. So this can either be because nothing provided, or maybe it's a request from the outside. This is where the user interface comes in. When um, the users select um, erase the package, then this rule gets added so that the solver doesn't install it because the user wants to erase. Same with installation. If the user clicks on once the package installed, then what really happens down in the uh, machine is that a unary rule with just a package gets added, which says to the sub-algorithm, as this must be true, A must be installed. Yeah, true is installed and false is packages don't install the package, so it's previously was installed, uninstalled it. Uh, if you have questions about something, just don't hesitate to ask me. Now, some slides about how the solving works, and then I show you what that means for dependencies. So, the solving algorithms. The main uh, algorithm is this unit propagation. And this is a special uh, word from the subforks. The rule is exactly called unit when all literals but one are false. And the special thing is, if it's unit, then the last literal must be true. So here's again the example. Say, this is false because it's an assertion, so C must be false, it's easy to see because the complete expression must be true, so C must be false. Then this rule over here is unit, C is false, as it's only one literal left, this one must be um, true, that means A must be false. 
And then we have a look here. We have uh, C was false because of this one. Um, A was also false. This rule is also unit. So B must be true. So we have a solution for this problem with unit propagation. And the complete solving algorithms work like this. Works like, like this. If there's nothing for propagation, we <coughs> will do a free choice. So we pick some undecided variable, assign basically a random value. This is all, first this part is basically heuristics. And then the next step is propagate all rules that are now unit. And if in the end nothing more propagate, if no rule is unit any longer, then continue with the first step. And do this as long as you have um, assignment for the variables and then you found a solution. Now you, of course you're thinking, oh, this is stupid. Uh, picking some random variable don't work, won't help us very much. But here's where you, where you um, program the direction the solver should take. So here's where you, you have program that the solution must be minimal, must change a minimal number of packages or, or must update as, as good as possible. So this is where you can program your goals and the, this is what's forced about this unit propagation is that what, what's forced from the dependencies from the RPMs. But I'll come to that later too. I can want to show you what unit propagation is if you think about RPM dependencies. So a requires rule, say this rule is unit. That means all must be true except one. Now if, uh, say, B3 is the one that is uh, not unassigned yet and all other is false, that means uh, A is uh, false, no, A is true, B1 is false and B2 is false. And unit propagation says B3 must be true. But that's basically what you'd expect because this is just, if I put that into a sentence, if A is installed and B1 and B2 are not installable, then I must install B3. So if, if, if I have a dependencies and uh, for a package that is installed and all my alternatives are, like, are just reduced to one left that are installable, then I must take that alternative. So this is actually very easy to understand. So what this does it adds packages to the set of installed packages. This is basically how every other solver also works. It checks dependencies that are unsolved and if it's more than one alternative it may try branching or try something different but if just one package left to install it chooses that one. And this other thing is if um, A is undecided and this is what, what the normal solvers normally don't do. If A is still left and the others are, for, are false so if none of all, if all the providers of the dependencies can't be installed a also can't be installed. This is normally what the, the solvers don't do. So this adds packages to the list of uh, conflicts or okay, this is a set of conflicts or set of uninstalled. So this says, this rule says uh, if those are forbidden for installation, then A must also be forbidden for installation. This is, so this is very nice to have because it, it runs the set of packages that, this one runs the set of packages that are the uninstalled and this one runs packages, list of packages that are conflicting or must be installed. Well, conflict rules are of course easy to understand if, if a conflict rule is if A conflicts with B, then if A is true, that means A is uh, not installed. No, if A is true, that means A is installed, but that means B1 must be false and thus uninstalled. This is pretty straightforward. <coughs> So, of course, if you normal solving algorithm, you probably know, you sometimes get contradictions. Same is true with the um, SAT solving. The unit propagation can lead to contradictions. Here's an example. Um, we have this rule, this expression, and maybe the SAT solver chose to install A. So, this is rule is unit, so we know B is true. This rule is unit because A is true, so now C is also true. And then 
we have this rule that tells us B conflicts with C, but we just established that we have to install both B and C, so this is a contradiction. So what happens is that the subsolver algorithm then um, check learns from all the rules that was involved that were involved with the contradiction and learns a new rule and adds this new rule, this is so called learned rule, to the set of rules. In this case it's very easy. The learned rule is just I can't install A because then we get this contradiction. But the learned rule can actually contain any numbers of uh, literals with uh, knots and as they can be they can be more complex than this one. And if I can't go back, if I can't undo all steps, then of course the complete program is unsolvable. In this case I could go back because this was all the contradiction was also the, only there if A was set to true. So I could um, undo the steps that led to the contradiction and then continue the solving. And the idea of learned rules was a major breakthrough for the subforks and it happened in 1969 and was implemented in the Grasp server. And this is really what makes the solving reliable so that it's really always, if there is a solution then the subserver will find it. So otherwise it will return um, a proof by the, why it's unsolvable. So it's, it's the code is really reliable because of this. And doesn't get stuck somehow or doesn't get stuck in an endless loop like the open server did. Surprising, actually, when you know the algorithm that, that uh, the other solvers like, like Smart or, or Yum or so don't use the algorithm because it's, it's easy to implement and it's fast and it works really, really well. Okay, but anyway, Susu must lead. That's why one one part of Susu can lead the development. No, okay. Just joking. <laughs> Okay, but coming back to the three choices, here is where really where you can direct the solver on what, what, the, what the aim is from the solving. So your normal goal is try to keep packages that were installed installed, so erase as, as um, less packages as possible, and also minimize the number of packages that get added, because you want, the user doesn't want um, the, the changes that don't need to be done. And the algorithm I implemented to do this is pretty easy. First of all, if there's a free choice, it checks if there are packages that were installed before and are not yet set to install, then it chooses those. So this is the first step. We try to keep all packages installed that already were installed. Of course, that depends on what the goal is. If your goal is to um, always um, have the newest version installed, you would change this to if a package was installed, try to install the newest version. So this here can tell how the solver should behave. And the other part is that it's dealing with how to find a minimal, minimal solution. If we have rules that are not yet true, because if the rules are true, I don't even want to look at it anymore. And all negative literals are false. Then I can choose from the positive literals any packages with some metric, maybe the best version, normally the best version, and install it. So in here with our um, example, if A is true, then I have this I have an unfulfilled dependency, so I have to choose between P1 and P2, and I um, choose the normally choose the package with the highest version, and then install it. And the strategy is if those two points are done, I can set all packages to false and have a valid solution because um, of this part here. All the rules that have negative um, um, literals are already done, so I can just set anything else to false and have a solution. And this is the minimization part because. I just, it makes 
sends to the, this is where I must in reinvest some work where I must install package to fulfill dependencies and all, if all packages dependencies are fulfilled then I'm basically done. That's that's maybe the best way to explain it. Okay. <coughs> Let's talk about policies, system policies. Um, the thing is if I only have the look at the uh, dependencies coming from RPM then the trivial solution is always don't install anything because if the uh, no RPM installed means no dependency broken so we are fin we are finished but this is not obviously not what the user wants <laughs> so we have system policy rules the policy rule basically defines what to do with installed packages um, some policies maybe must not be deinstalled or downgraded or must not change architecture that's also normally what, what we in SUSE do in OpenSUSE do so we have installed package with a 32 bit we just we want to keep no, so let's talk about GDC have a GDC with uh, I686 and the solver if this is installed the solver must suddenly change it to I586 so we in SUSE we, we try to try to no, we insist that the architecture doesn't change without the user confirming it. Or a vendor changes the same thing. If the package is from SUSE, then, then the repository contains a package, say, from Pac-Man, then the server mustn't use the uh, other um, package without asking the user that it's okay to change to a different vendor. So this is such policies are defined with policy rules, and the rule format just looks like that. You notice there's no uh, negative uh, in uh, packaging it, so this is, says either A must be installed, or A2 must be installed, or A3 must be installed, or A4 must be installed. Which pretty much defines the package, it says to the solver, you can replace this installed package A with any of those, but that's it. So, packages with different arch or different vendor are simply not in this list, so the solver knows that it must install it. Now normally, as I said, with those um, um, packages and the system rules, you normally get um, um, unsolvable problems because maybe you want to make, install the newest version of Emirate which needs, a, needs some other package from, um, from the Pac-Man repository or so, so you, 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 then you get the package system is unresolvable and you want to ask the, system, the user is it okay to switch my vendor? This is done with the standard um, problem reporting mechanism. And the trick is, as I said, systems without any, um, just when, when you look only at the RPM dependencies, then it's always solvable. So if that, um, I can turn that around. If I find that the system is unsolvable, then there must be at least one rule involved in the uh, proof. This is either a job rule, so this is user click install me that package or erase the package, or a policy rule, because that is this package must only be replaced with that, and then that package. So and furthermore, so I can um, I get from the algorithm bed all the rules involved in the um, in the uh, with why it's, in, it's what's not solvable or in the contradiction. If I now break one, any one of those rules, the system, the system gets um, this. The conflict is gone, and, and the system may be solvable again. So the suggestion, solu suggested solutions is um, just do away with one of <coughs> any one of those rules. Normally, we, we just as we as of this we have. Um, at least one system or job rule and we can um, create suggestions by um, leaving out the, all the IPM rules because we normally don't want to uh, break RPM rules because this, this leads to an inconsistent system um, so we just say ask the user is it okay to break that job rule which means um, you clicked install that package 
maybe you won't, don't want to do that and just uh, leave the old package alone or don't install that. Or maybe do away with the policy rule. That means, is it okay to uh, delete that package? Or is it okay to change the vendor? So this is, and the good thing is, the user knows all that. So it knows what's going on there. Because the user either clicked, if it's a job rule, the user either directly clicked there on that, or and the user has also an understanding about those policy, policy rules because they are so easy that just um, don't change the vendor, don't change the art, or whatever. So this is, if the user gets a suggestion that he understands. Okay, that was basically my, my I stretched the surface of the algorithm, so if you are interested in more in-depth part, you will have to currently have to look at the code or ask me email. The, the code is in the library called Lipsat Solver, which is currently in the OpenSUSE factory. Um, unfortunately, as we are heavily hacking on the code, the documentation really, really uh, is not basically ex not there. Uh, how feasible is it to really use it in other? Um, just uh, it's, 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 can, it's actually in SUSE it's used in different projects uh, yeah. well, not, not only in SUSE because it's, it's just a oh, well. generic solving library well I was not thinking about the outside of in SUSE uh, oh, it's, it's, it would be easy to, to put in a different yeah. server yeah. the library is so simple it could be maybe yeah. in the Python interface you, have, or you, yeah. you do have bindings for it so, so you're producing a whole match when you're making a PC policy or something like this not um, Adding features for you. Sorry, you, you, you're focusing on uh, doing it like uh, feasible for lights so others can yeah, use it. Yeah, it, it, it's very cool. modular and it's generic. We try, we don't. It's not so specific. Actually, it also already contains some code about for Debian. If it wants to, somebody wants to use it for Debian solving because Debian have some different uh, things which provides and requires and RPM does. So, so it's, it's pretty generic. And, and all the zoo specific stuff is in libsyp, so... And also we are working on... But that's, that's algorithmically not that interesting. We are working on a new repository uh, format to replace the XML format, which, which really makes things fast, because, um, because the, the repository files are very, very small compared to, uh, to the XML. Of course, that's, that's easy to do. <laughs> and, um, the trick is that this is dictionary based. So we have we first have a string space in, in front of the file. So we have where we define all the strings and assign integers to the strings. So just string one is that, that and string two is that. And then the, all the dependency lists and so on are only list of integers, which is good because integers. Um, if I have 64 bit, I can still fit in 32 bit. And with but with pointers to depend to the string, that's only 64 bit. So the solving, solving doesn't take more memory if it runs on a 64-bit machine and it's string compare as the, uni, as the dictionaries get unified string compare is that easy if you do an exact compare you just compare the integer if it's the integers are the same you know the strings are the same so this is this is what's really making the new sol uh, limits so fast and not really the solving but the solving too but this is much more okay any questions on the Previous slide. Um, ah. Oh, wrong direction. When you're talking about um, trying to remove a rule to find a, to change from an unsolvable yep. thing into a solvable thing, if if you try removing one uh, a rule and for every rule and you still don't find a solution, could you then start removing two, or do you not try that? Um, actually, what, what happens is that. Um, there's a an, an function called refine suggestion that looks if it's now solvable and if not, and this is and adds, adds more. If, it, if it's, it knows what to do, it, it just adds more rules to remove. Because normally, if I um, delete, say, Perl or so, then I want to list all those other packages, all pack Perl packages um, don't need to be removed. And, this one will just give you one, but then you click OK, and then it brings up a request the next per rule, and that's not what the user writes, the user likes to see list of. So this is why the refined solutions then adds more rules to it, yes. So 
we, we, we're doing some clever things that the user, user interaction can be minimized. But this is more complex to complex for that part. <laughs> and I kept on the easy stuff here. Another question. No, another question, yeah. Um, presumably once you found the solution, the, the intention is that you can do a single RPM transaction to take the system to the new solved state. Yeah. Um, have you thought about because it sometimes because RPM is not truly transactional, like <laughs> Jeff will, will be delighted to hear that. <laughs> in in the fact that I mean, for example, if you have um, if you're if you're removing uh, an RPM and the you know the, the un uninstalled script fails or so on, then in, in those cases there's no easy way of reliably backtrack or rollback doing rollback. So have you thought about maybe um, doing a separate step where you after you've got a solution that you're trying to get to, then you, you break up the, uh, the the journey to that solution into multiple smaller transactions to make the thing uh, more reliable. So that if one if one smaller transaction fails, then the rollback is is not going to be as. To tell you the truth, um, Lipsip normally just doesn't do it in a complete RPM, but in single steps, and so it doesn't. Doesn't use RPM, RPM with one big transaction, but okay. with, with uh, one feeds of one RPM after each other with minus minus force minus minus no depth, so you've got to implement that transaction. So, but yeah, the, you have still have the problem that if the script fails, the other all installed RPMs normally don't have some um, downgrade script or so because uh, there wasn't something like that to, to go back, edit into RPM 5, the rollback basically. Demand that the strength that either the entire transaction works or the one the transaction works. So if there's a script failure that undertakes to undo what was previously solved and put back in what was there before, uh, the problem comes in that uh, there's scripts, there's a lot of way to write scripts. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And uh, even if you roll back, you're not moving forward. But yeah. You really want to move forward. Yeah. Okay. So, Approach. There is no solvable approach. Okay. What was supposed to happen is there's sufficient QA to take out the script failures and typos, and there's enough discipline. Okay. Uh, our opinion goes to great length to compute the resolution of every file. If you know what every file is supposed to happen okay, beforehand, and there are no failures, the rest of it is just a state machine cranking away. Okay. There are exceptional failures, like the disk fails in the middle, you get a power failure. Scripts add a whole extra dimension that the handle of the sat solver. Oh, great, yeah. Right. Okay, yeah. And, but breaking it down into a smaller transaction does hard. Uh, PLB does this. It's fair. And you can read myself. Uh, and you can read it. I'm less aware of that. Uh, it's not too hard. RPM marks levels in the tree. So we could process subtrees as subtransaction, but don't bother it. Uh, but but this is just the layer above it. So yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Doing the real installation, this is different layer. Yeah, of course. I'm not working on that. Yeah. Give that to other folks. Have you tried integrating with RPM? Sorry? Have you tried integrating with RPM or you just lived it? It's, it's just it's a, so. But feel free. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> yeah. guys, we're running out of I noticed that uh, when doing several, well, doing it in many several uh, transactions instead of one or larger ones, it's